Okay, um, why don't we get started? Uh, welcome everybody to the LTR Career Panel in Academia webinar. Um, we are so pleased that you all were able to join us. This uh, webinar is following on a series of webinars um, that the LTR network put on in 2020. And we had a similar sort of panel um, series on non-academic careers. And this year, the graduate student committee and the graduate students within LTR um, suggested that uh, this next follow on event could focus on careers within academia. We all know there's a diversity of institutional types and experience um, at, in different kinds of institutions. So the um, uh, I am Jen Cassell and together with Marty Downs, we represent the LTR network office. And with, um, I'm, I'm pleased to introduce Natasha Chrisman and Brian Kim, who are members and leads of the LTR Graduate Student Committee. Um, and we have a incredible lineup of panelists for this discussion. So just a little bit of housekeeping first, we are going to leave lots of time for open discussion and questions. And the way that you can do that is use the Q&A box or the little Q&A icon down at the bottom of your webinar screen. And you can actually type in Q&A throughout the presentations. So just keep them coming. Um, another feature is that you can upvote questions. So you should see a little, I think a little uh, thumb raising icon. So um, rather than retype the exact same question, it might be simpler to just upvote and that will help us the moderators be able to choose questions um, at the end if we don't have time for all of them that are of great interest. Um, you can also use the raise your hand function and we will do our very best to try to look at the participants list, the attendees and unmute you if we can, but I think it goes a little faster and easier if you just go ahead and use the Q&A box. Um, it's a little bit easier for us to track. So um, with that, uh, one other housekeeping um, uh, item is that we are recording this webinar and we will be placing this on the LTER um, YouTube channel afterwards. If you would like to ask questions in the Q&A anonymously, you can do that. That's a choice. You don't have to put your name on there. So, um, so yes, yeah, so we are recording. And I think that's all the housekeeping that I have. So with that, I would like to just briefly introduce Nicole Chrisman and David Kim from the LTR Student Committee, who I think are going to just give some very brief introductory remarks. Um, the format for today's uh, webinar then is that um, our panelist Nicole will be giving a overview presentation and then all of our panelists will do brief introductions of themselves and then we'll just leave lots of time for Q&A. Hopefully a good 45 minutes or so and we can stay as, as long as, um, as, as time allows. So thank you. Nicole, I'm, I'm sorry, not Nicole, Natasha and Brian are up next. Um, hey everyone, um, I'm Natasha Chrisman. I'm the co-chair of the LTR Graduate Student Committee um, and graduate representative for the Arctic LTR. Uh, hi guys, I'm Brian. I'm the other co-chair currently, and I'm the grad rep for the Beaufort Lagoon Ecosystem LTR. So we have a lot of um, polar representation in the co-chair positions right now. Uh, but yeah, so last year, as Jen mentioned, we did a series on looking at careers outside of academia. Uh, but we also realized that there is still just a lot of mystery behind um, the positions within academia. There's a lot of variety in there. And I feel like oftentimes we kind of get close to the types of institutions that we're at, uh, which tend to be R1, R2 if you're a grad student. Um, so this is just kind of a way for us to kind of learn about different um, areas within academia. Um, so yeah, so with that being said, uh, I'd like to introduce two panelists and then Natasha will introduce two panelists and then uh, we can move on to the presentation. Um, so first, our first panelist is Dr. Nicole Millette. She's an assistant professor of biological sciences at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, um, and VIMS is considered an R2 institute. Uh, our second panelist is Dr. Denise Brusowitz. She's an associate professor of environmental studies at Colby College, uh, which is a liberal arts or primarily undergraduate serving institution. Um, we're also joined by Lisa Collins, a professor at Santa Monica City College, a community college. 
um, and formerly USC, a private R1 institution. Um, and then lastly, Andrew Rassweiler, an assistant professor in biological sciences at Florida State University, a public R1 institution. Um, so with that, on behalf of the LTR graduate student uh, committee, thank you for joining us um, and take it away, Nicole. Can everyone or can people see my presentation? Is that sharing and at full screen like it's supposed to be? Yes, it is. Great. Excellent. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you uh, for, for Brian and Natasha to inviting me to be a part of this today. Um, the presentation's not why you guys are here, the, really to ask questions. So um, I'm going to uh, just try to run through this as quickly as possible, um, but hopefully there's some good baseline information. Um, and also I based, well, actually I got this presentation from um, something that graduate students at VIMS put together just this past fall. So if you have already seen this presentation or if you gave this presentation last fall, sorry. Um, all right, so you're thinking about going into academia, um, but academia means a lot and there's a lot of different possibilities. So what kind of academia could you go into? Um, and so just some really, really basic baselines. Um, you could go to a fairly standard R1 slash R2 uh, university. These are going to be your institutions that have all the way up to PhD granting. So master's, PhD, undergrads, um, and they're gonna be fairly intense on the research focus. The main difference between these two is really just like how much money is coming in. They're often described as um, really research focused or just like heavily research focused, something like that. So it's just, it's a, there's a lot of money coming in through outside grants into these institutions and they are granting um, a certain amount of PhDs. Uh, and then you also will have institutions that um, that are still have research at them, but they only do um, up to master's uh, granting. So at these places, you still have a research focus, might be a little bit more heavy of a, a teaching focus associated with them. And the type of students you get in is only going to be master's. So with like a lab you might set up, it's going to have a little bit more turnover rate going on, um, but you'll still be doing research. Uh, and then you'll have, um, there's also primarily undergraduate institutions. And so these, these still have research going on, uh, but you will only be doing research with undergrads that you have um, available to you. And so there's, um, there will be an obvious emphasis on teaching uh, much more than these, some of these other institutions, but then still some level of um, research expectation. Uh, and then there are um, minor minority serving institutions, um, and these are also going to be uh, a lot more balanced between service, research, and uh, teaching. And so where you're spending your time, again, it's not going to necessarily be just on research as you might be used to as a graduate student. You'll have to expand your skill set and um, become an expert in a wider range of things. Um, and then there's also um, more community college or two-year colleges where it, the focus is um, on teaching and teaching the next generation and sharing knowledge. So there's not really much research going there. And so with a lot of these different types, it's really the balance between teaching and research and what you think you might be interested in. So a lot of the times, as was um, mentioned earlier, a lot of us are used to R1 and R2s because that is where we have to go to get uh, PhDs a lot of the time. And then thinking to head to a career in academia, all we think about is just doing what we have reflected um, upon us. But there's all of these other possibilities that might be a better fit for someone for a variety of reasons. So how do you determine that? Um, and so as you prepare for any one of these different um, institutions, there's um, different things that you have to, to take into account.
account. And so this is, you know, as you would expect for if you're going to an R1, R2 institution, you, you need to have that postdoc experience, you need to have publications, you need to have an indication that you're going to bring funding into the institution through grant writing. And there will be some of a variety of expectations when it comes to teaching, but they don't expect you to have taught numerous classes and developed multiple curriculums um, and, and have just a whole list of teaching experiences under your belt, where some of these other options, you will have to have a lot more um, increasing degrees of teaching experience. So obviously um, with a community college or definitely with some liberal arts colleges, uh, they not only wanna see teaching experience, they want to see uh, really unique ways of teaching and ways of engaging uh, the class. And then with some of these other primary elite undergraduate serving institutions and these minority serving institutions, this is well, you're going to need to make sure that you have um, a very robust uh, teaching experience on your CV and you're able to actually talk about a teaching style and um, ex different examples of how you've applied that teaching style and why you prefer the teaching style that you do. Uh, and um, and so what how do you know what is the right fit for you because there's a lot to take into account and only some of it has to do with uh, with research here and you know whether you want to do research or not so uh, the big thing that's meant you know if you if you want to do um, a postdoc um, or if you want to go into, I should say, some of these positions, you really have to take into account whether you want to do a postdoc or not. And that's not nothing to consider because postdocs, um, a lot of the time, you have to uproot yourself and move someplace else with the expectation that you'll only be there for maybe uh, two, three years maximum. And it's not uncommon for people to have to do two postdocs. I personally did two postdocs. I moved to Miami for a year and then I moved up to Massachusetts for two years. And so that um, is a lot of moving and it was very stressful on me and my significant other. And that was a lot to take into account. Um, got me where I wanted to be, but it's uh, at some point you have to ask yourself what what's worth it. Um, Considering too, you know, uh, what what's target salary are you looking for? Um, some of the R1, R2 institutions might have a higher salary than some of these other places. How important is that to you? What what are you? Um, what's good for you and your family? Um, some of these ones might have um, less. I shouldn't say lower time commitment, but different kinds of time commitments at least, and what works best for, for you and your family. Uh, location, where do you want to, how important is location? Uh, because if, you, if you're if you targeting a specific region, as soon as you put limitations on where you will and won't go, your uh, what you can pick from drastically decreases. That's not a bad thing. And people, important is, uh, location is a very important thing that people consider, and it's not bad to have uh, for that to be a factor, but it does limit what you are applying to and something to take into account of maybe you have to broaden what you're looking for within that region in order to increase your application where you can submit applications. Um, and um, what, how important is it to have uh, resources available to you at your institution? What kind of resources are you looking to have available? What kind of support? Are you looking to have from uh, from your colleagues or the institution itself things like that because that will vary with these different types of places. Um, and some other things that um, I, I want to put out there that's also worth considering. Um, I mentioned uh, this first one here, um, having a uh, working at a college associated research institution. Um, I throw that specifically in there because that's actually what I do. Um, so I, I'm at a research institution that used to stand on its own 
and eventually got connected to a college that allows it to have graduate students and be able to uh, grant degrees. Uh, but I, um, I didn't really view myself that much as part of this college that we're associated with. And that relationship um, is uh, varies in terms of how uh, how strongly connected they are. We tend to operate kind of as our own thing, but that means that I primarily only interact with graduate students and I teach maybe one class a semester and it's going to be dominated by graduate students and it's very, very research focused. And you're gonna find a lot of these institutions around uh, the United States. Um, another thing to keep take into consideration is a liberal arts college. Um, these tend to have different expectations in terms of the the kind of learning that the the students are doing and uh, what they're getting out of the college experience. And so, and that can vary between different liberal arts institutions, but definitely with these ones, they're looking for you to have pretty, pretty decent um, teaching expectations. And those are the ones that are going to want to see a more uh, innovative teaching style, or at least an effort for more innovative teaching style. And then also considering a private versus public institutions as well, um, and where the money is coming from. Um, so one way to go about considering your own fit and the best way to find a fit um, for you is um, looking, considering uh, this, uh, this diagram here, it's apparently called uh, SWOT, uh, your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats. Um, and what I think is really useful about it is this idea of internal origin versus external origin. Uh, so, you know, what are, what are your personal strengths and weaknesses? And then externally, what opportunities and then threats do you have to achieving your goal? And these external ones are really, really important to consider uh, because they're things that could get in the way or you're not even aware of um, are, are helping you. And so just from my own personal experience, uh, just very quickly, um, put that out there, um, some uh, external opportunities that helped me was um, I, in graduate school, I got a, a C grant fellowship for two years as a graduate student. And then that made me, and so that helped me get my first postdoc because it ended up being with NOAA and having a C grant, which is very outreach focused um, on my resume, looked, um, helped me look good with the NOAA institution. And um, then my next uh, postdoc, I actually got a postdoc fellowship through a different C grant office in Woods Hole. And I only looked good through there because I had these other opportunities with um, another C grants and then with NOAA. And so I looked particularly an excellent fit for this unique one-time fellowship that came along and just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Um, and those aren't things that I was preparing for as I went along, but all of those things lining up helped me navigate my path to where I, I ended up. Um, uh, but then, you know, threats that can come along is, um, I mean, the biggest one is rejections. You just get papers rejected, you get proposals rejected. Uh, fellowships rejected, jobs rejected, and you know how much can can you deal with that? How much are you willing to keep moving forward and think that you're on the right path despite all of the no's or in a lot of cases responses you're not getting back? Um, and at what point do you consider maybe maybe this isn't a healthy path for you or this isn't what you want the rest of your life to be and you consider alternatives. Um, I'm going very long, so I just wanna speed through this. Um, and so um, just very quickly touching on how to prepare for teaching and research um, when you're looking for academia. And so experience is key to both of these. And so finding any opportunity you have to teach if you are at an undergraduate institution where you have undergraduates available 
and um, you, you know, try to, to TA for classes, uh, see if you have the opportunity to develop your own course and uh, be able to, to teach that. That's the best possible thing to do. But guest lectures, anything where you are making a lecture, you're thinking about how you are sharing information to someone and uh, figure out um, how to highlight that properly on your CV so that they don't just see is that you were you did something for a class once, but that you were very you very specific with exactly what you did for that class. Um, and then learning how to prepare for uh, research. Um, so, you know, there's the the, the two big ones um, publish in scientific journals um, and then also uh, writing proposals. So usually through a lot of people get pretty good experience with uh, publishing and um, the first paper is always the hardest. You get over that hump and everything just slowly seems to get easier in terms of writing and going through the, the, the whole publication process. So just start doing it because you're going to have to. Um, but then when it comes to writing these proposals, uh, this is this is really hard. And sometimes people even make it all the way to like an assistant professor position and haven't really written a proposal yet. Uh, so one thing I really encourage myself is actually apply through a variety of fellowships. Um, these, these fellowships in a lot of ways are really similar format to grants. I once applied to a postdoc fellowship that was 12 pages and had a full budget and it wasn't a fellowship, it was a full grant. Um, and so that's really, really good experience. But then also go through your postdoc advisor or your PhD advisor. I had my PhD advisor my last year said, if you write an NSF proposal, um, I will you know, we'll, we'll submit it and it'll let you stay here as a postdoc. And it didn't get funded, but it was a great experience. And, um, and so then when do you start applying for academic jobs? Um, for postdocs, it's never too early to start looking. Um, uh, sorry. Um, and so for, for, for postdocs, it's never start early. I uh, really never start, er, uh, never too early to start thinking about who you would want to do a postdoc with. And you can start reaching out, you know, one to two years before you're thinking you're going to finish up your PhD, um, work on some grants with them, add, add some, some text to a grant so they can consider you as uh, a postdoc possibly, uh, look for postdoc fellowships you can be applying to. Uh, one of the hardest ways to actually get a postdoc is to find a job, um, a, call, a call for, for a postdoc on a job site, um, because you never know if that's posted only as a requirement and there's actually already someone in mind. So those are really hard to do. And so start laying the groundwork um, earlier, if you, especially if you find someone you're really excited about. And then with faculty jobs, um, your, your last year of your PhD, um, even without a postdoc, it, you never know what could happen. Put, put some applications in, especially if there's a specific place that really, really excites you. Um, or you think you would be a great fit. Um, every once in a while, lightning does strike, uh, but usually you do need some postdoc experience and you just, you, you keep putting applications out there. And for me, the first two years, it was radio silence. And all of a sudden, it felt like the third year I put in applications out, all of a sudden and I was getting hits. Uh, I don't know what changed, uh, but something changed and it, it you just you just keep you keep at it and eventually the you will start getting you know calls or um, asking people asking for your references or getting asked to do skype interviews or on person um, in-person interviews um and then um sorry just because i'm going long i'm gonna skip through the rest of this um Here we go. And this was this was put, like I said, this this talk was put together by people at VIMS and only because they had talked so highly of this uh, this workshop that um, that was put on by this group. Um, the, the applications for this year, well, they closed today, but keeping in mind for future years, because they do this every year, um, that this this event is great for people 
who are graduate students and thinking about going into academia. Um, it's not just for for that, but it's a it's a mixture of a lot of different types of educators coming together. But it does include people, um, graduate students looking to take that next step, including workshops such as this. Um, so from the 2020 workshop, they had a preparing for an academic career group. And so this might be a useful resource in the future. I apologize for all of the time that I took and I will stop talking now. Thank you, Nicole. Um, super useful. And thanks to everyone who's starting to type questions in the Q&A as well. Remember, you can do that throughout. Nicole, have you concluded your remarks or do you want to do any few more minutes on your intro or, or is that your intro? I'm sorry. Um, you, you, if you want to add anything, I think we'll have you up first if that's. Oh, oh, uh, okay. Just to transition to those. Um, I guess uh, real, real quick. Um, my, my background is, is in oceanography, um, I should say. And I, um, I did my PhD at the, at a small research laboratory associated with the University of Maryland called Horn Point. Um, and then, um, I did one postdoc for a year that was in Miami at a NOAA lab there, but I was technically employed by Mississippi State University. It was a whole, uh, it was very, interesting. Um, and then after a year, I went up to to Woods Hole Cape in the Cape Cod area and did um, a postdoc there for for two years. And then um, I'm now currently at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Um, and I started just last year. So it feels like I haven't started at all. Yes, this last year definitely feels like a non starter for many of us. Um, thank you, Nicole. So I'm just going to um, call on our panelists in order and let each of them introduce themselves and, and give a short overview of their background and pathway. Denise, would you like to start us off? Or follow Nicole, sorry, not starting. Thanks, Nicole. Sure, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Denise Bruzewitz and um, I'm currently a associate professor at Colby College, which is a small liberal arts school. Uh, sort of in the Venn diagram, I guess it would be a, a particular kind of PUI institution. Um, I got my PhD at the University of Notre Dame. Um, so I guess a private, I actually don't really know if it's R1 or R2, but <laughs> maybe somebody out there does. Um, uh, and in freshwater um, biogeochemistry, um, then um, I was really kind of interested in understanding what uh, work-life balance looked like in other parts of the world in academia. Um, and so wound up in New Zealand um, doing a postdoc there um, at the University of Waikato on um, sort of lake nitrogen cycling um, uh, and uh, sort of algal blooms and that kind of thing. And then uh, realized that it was gonna be really, really hard to get a tenure track job in the US from New Zealand. Um, and at that, and I also should mention, I had um, uh, my first child there in New Zealand. Um, and then, so yeah, started applying for postdocs back in the US um, and uh, went to the University of Texas Marine Science Institute for a NOAA funded postdoc um, and was there for two years as well. Um, and then uh, started my position here at Colby College after that. Thank you for that, Denise. Um, Andrew, would you like to go next, please? Sure, yeah. So uh, I'm Andrew Rathsweller. I'm a, a marine ecologist, and I'm associated with the uh, Santa Barbara Coastal LTER and also somewhat with the uh, Morea Coral Reef LTER. Um, so I'm at uh, Florida State University, which definitely fits the sort of um, large public, uh, sort of the classic state school, big R1 institution. Um, I think Nicole did a great job of describing sort of the, the challenges or the sort of trade-offs of, of going the R1 route. My personal route is not, is a little, I think, unusual in the sense that I did my PhD at UCSB and then I, I, I took various different positions at UCSB without ever moving. So I did my PhD in the Department of um, 
now I'm for EEMB, Ecology, Evolution, Marine Biology. That's the one. Uh, and, and then I did a postdoc actually with an economist at UCSB. So it was a really different um, discipline, but the same place. Uh, so I did a couple years of a postdoc and then I um, transitioned into, uh, I was a research, a various research scientist type positions at first working on grants that I wasn't a PI on and then working on grants that I was a PI on. And then in 2016, <clears throat> I got a job um, as an assistant professor at, at Florida State, which is where I am right now. So I've been there for five, six years now. I'm just coming up for tenure next year. So, so that's sort of where I am in the, in the trajectory here. Andrew, just because I know you, I'm gonna call you out just a little bit. Could you okay. maybe comment or at least refer to, because I think there will be a lot of interest from the grad students that, you have a, a family as well with an academic spouse. And I think that might be of interest to other people. And if you don't address that now, that's okay. We can just circle totally. back in the question. That is a, sorry Jenna, if I'm out of line calling that out, but I, I know that is of interest to a lot of our graduate students. Absolutely. And I think that is, so I was at, I was at UCSB for uh, eight years after my PhD, but before I got a faculty job. And I think the fact that I had, so my wife is now also a professor at Florida State, but I think that's one reason that for me, it sort of took, a, we sort of were a little slow in getting our act together and applying for faculty jobs because of the challenge of the two body problem. Um, and so uh, it happens that when we went to Florida State uh, that I got an offer there and then we were able to negotiate a position for Sarah She's in the geography department there, which was appropriate for her background, even though she's also a marine ecologist. So I'm happy to answer questions about that or discuss it. It is a real challenge, although it's very, um, uh, I don't think there's a, a unified solution for it. Thank you so much. Okay, Lisa, last but definitely not least. Hi. So. Um... Lisa Collins. I am a tenured professor at Santa Monica College um, in the Earth Sciences Department. I'm a oceanographer by training, but I teach um, I teach geology and oceanography. Um, I started at SNC in 2016, and so the tenure process at uh, the California Community Colleges is a four year process. Everybody goes to the same thing, um, and it's pretty pretty structured. Um, I did my PhD at the University of Southern California, which is a private R1, also in Los Angeles. Um, so I came out to Los Angeles. I'm from the East Coast originally, and I came out to LA for graduate school. Um, so I figured out probably in my last two years of grad school, I did not want to work in R1. I just saw, I looked around me and I saw what people were doing and I thought I could do that, but I don't know that I want to do that. And then I happened to meet the person that became my spouse like in the last year and a half. And he was tied to Los Angeles because of a job. He's an engineer, works on biomedical stuff. It also was tied to his green card, all these wonderful things. And so it was like, all right, well, I guess I'm gonna settle in LA because there's, there's no leaving. Um, so I was really fortunate to move um, at USC from the earth science department when I finished my PhD. Um, I was hired in the environmental studies program at USC to teach there. And that program was entirely run by non tenure track faculty. So it was kind of weird, but um, a lot of universities are doing this where they have faculty they're just dedicated to teaching there is no tenure process there um, it's a year-to-year -year contract and then it moves up to three-year contracts um, so it was really a really good experience and I kind of told my advisor and other people well, I'll treat this like a teaching postdoc I'm going to get a ton of teaching experience I got to design new classes and teach them I got to do a ton of field classes with my students. I took students to Belize every summer for a class. And so it was really, really, really nice. But in the end, um, I wanted the chance of academic security and tenure. And so I had known the whole time I was interested in teaching at community colleges and I had been sending out applications. Um, and then I just happened to hit the one year, the one only place I applied to was SMC and I happened to hit it. I mean, I was pregnant on the job market. I wouldn't have done it if my applications weren't already ready. Who would hire that person? 
Um, but it all ended up working out really well. Um, so yeah. <laughs> and I, I answered a couple of questions from people asking me about um, salary and stuff in the community colleges in California, many, most of the state, all the state universities here, um, that information is public because it is paid for by taxes. Um, so sometimes you have to dig, but you can find that. And what was really nice at the community college is that um, the salary schedule, they just place it, you on it. They look at the number of years you have teaching and they look at the degree you've earned. Um, so that last column is for PhDs. So you can slot in the years you've taught and you kind of know exactly where you're going to start. Um, so also that was another reason I left the private school and went to the public school. I knew I was gonna be paid more and have better benefits. People are always shocked to hear the private school didn't pay well. Um, but that was another reason uh, because I do have a family and you know, working spouse as well. Um, and LA is expensive. So that was another reason for the decision as well. Great, thanks Lisa and everybody um, for those introductions. And so um, I, we have quite a few questions rolling in already and I'll um, moderate and try to direct them towards um, some, maybe not everybody has to answer every question, um, although we certainly can do that. Attendees, uh, thank you for um, rolling these questions and keep them coming. And if you do actually really want to hear from one or another of the panelists on a given question, go ahead and put that in so I know who to direct it towards as well. Otherwise, you're stuck with me facilitating. So um, let's get started. Some of the questions have been moved over to the answered part of the Q&A. Um, and that's fine. And we may revisit those and do some of those verbally as well. But for now, I'm going to start with a, a highly upvoted question. And um, I'm going to direct this first to Lisa, but I actually think that um, any of the panelists may want to weigh in on this. The question is, what are better or worse academic jobs? For example, R1 versus PU, uh, PUI prof. And for those of you who um, aren't familiar with that acronym, it means primarily undergraduate institution. So what are better or worse academic jobs for those who want a healthy work-life balance or may even want to work less than 40 hours per week? Lisa, if you could start, and then um, I am going to circle around to you other panelists as well. In fact, you guys can actually just unmute yourselves and start a conversation. But Lisa, why don't you kick that off? Yeah, I think that um, this goes to what Nicole was talking about in the introduction about looking at your strengths and weaknesses and figuring out what you like to do. Um, at a community college, we teach a ton. We are in the classroom 15 hours a week. So that's 15 units. Um, for me, that's three classes. It's two lab-based and one that's only a lecture. And then we have four hours of office hours that have to happen a week and they have to be on three different days. So we're expected to be on campus a minimum of three days a week, if not more. Um, but our contract is to be in what they consider a full work week is 30 hours a week. And so at my school um, and with having small kids at home, there's a pretty good balance in the sense that I'm not working, I feel like a ton. Um, but then again, with small children, I feel like there's always you end up working at night because something happens. And so nine o'clock is the magic hour and it gets quiet and work gets done. And I think, yeah, everybody that happens to everyone. Um, but just because that that's my balance at SMC, I know that that's not true for everybody. All the California community colleges, I have a friend who left recently a community college because she was constantly being forced to work in overload and it was just way too much for her. And so she wanted to leave and she did. Um, but, you know, it, it's hard because you have to kind of figure out the culture of an institution, and that can be really difficult to figure out when you're in that interview stage. Um, community colleges, the interviews are scripted, like literally every candidate is asked the same exact questions, and you can't defer off of that, so. This is such an upvoted question. Um, and just to kick us off, why don't each of you take it? You're all at different kinds of institutions. And this question is getting at, you know, comparing those. Yeah, I'll jump in from the extreme other end. Um, you know, my teaching responsibilities are very reasonable at Florida State. So I, I teach one class, one undergraduate class a semester, um, even actually a little bit less than that. And then I teach, um, you know, some graduate reading group seminars. So the, 
Before COVID, my time was not principally taken up by teaching, but the, the, the time was, more of it was taken up by research. But it does, uh, it does take a huge amount of time. And I moved um, from, a, a, uh, from a research position where I was funding my own salary off of grants and that felt stressful. And then now I'm faculty and I had sort of thought it would feel less stressful, but it's, it's maybe just as stressful or sort of similarly stressful because now I have a lab of grad students and postdocs and stuff and I have to support their work. And so, um, you know, it is a career path, which I think the, the, the pressure to work comes from different places, but um, at the R1, although there, it's a little less structured, it's like very much comes from your sort of obligations to your lab and your um, grants and stuff, but it's still, um, I don't know anyone who works a 40 hour week uh, in, in my you know, faculty. And so, um, and I also have small kids, so it's also a lot of late nights and, and that kind of stuff, so. Yeah, I want to, oh, sorry, go ahead, Denise. Sorry, um, I, this is a, I mean, this is a tough question. I think the, um, the thing that Andrew just said that really resonated with me and is something I thought about a lot when I accepted this job was that idea of sort of carrying the stress of um, providing for other people at earlier stages in their career, like those, you know, those grad students, the postdocs. Um, and at the time also with having, you know, two babies at home, I really felt like I didn't want to carry that burden, that I didn't want to have to have other people's livelihoods and careers dependent upon me and my time that I could give to them. Um, and so for me, that um, was one of the reasons why I felt a liberal, liberal arts school was the better option because I could still, you know, I can still very much um, engage in my research in really meaningful ways. I can involve my students in it. But at the end of the day, you know, their ability to buy groceries or pay their rent doesn't depend on me. <laughs> um, so I think that, um, you know, having been a postdoc and a grad student and seen that uh, with my own advisors, I, I felt like um, that was not something for me that was right then. But now as my kids are getting older, I, I do think, well, maybe I could take that on later, right? Um, so I think another thing to say is like, if you continue to sort of stay engaged in your research community and you keep doing the work you're doing, um, there's no reason why you have to stay in one type of, you know, you can move around. I think um, it's possible. Um, and the less than 40 hours a week thing, um, the only real concrete examples of that I've ever seen is when partners share a position. And I've, I've heard of a few cases of that where there's literally one position at an institution and they split it in two and, you know, work it out where somebody's teaching the classes and the other one's doing research and then they switch or, you know, different permutations like that. Yeah, the one thing I just, I wanted to, to go off of, uh, what, what both Denise and Andrew had touched on is that it's it's a culture uh, thing and so it's you know it's it's what you put on yourself and it's also what you what is expected of you or what you're following the examples of what other people are doing or what you think you're supposed to be doing and the like the work life balance is is hard at any institution you go to, I think, because it is ingrained in us throughout our careers that we have to be working more than 40 hours and we have to be putting in all of this extra effort. And it's something that has to get, I, I think, should change. And I think there should be efforts and there's places that are definitely better compared to others, but it's something that's got to get uh, broken <laughs> on, on a large uh, institutional scale, I would say. And I personally try to to set good healthy boundaries um, myself and demonstrate that to my students as well. I will say I'm I was very excited to end up where I was because it seems to be like first of all my graduate institution because it was so small was a very by five o'clock it seemed to clear out 
most part there was like i remember there was one professor like i would have to come in on the weekends occasionally and it's like they would see me and they would be like mm, good you're working on the weekends and i'd be like don't 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 give me that look and no that's not supposed to be what you're encouraging um and i kind of get a similar feeling from where i currently am again hard to tell i don't interact with people <laughs> haven't really done that um but um there just there isn't this like intense competition pressure of everyone has to be giving all of their time um and you can pick that out from like when people respond to emails how late into the evening do they respond on the weekends can you get a hold of people should you be getting a hold of people <laughs> kind of things like that or stuff i guess to watch out for earlier on great thank you all for that um, there's a, a series of questions somewhat related to a transition that I think many of our attendees, the grad students are making, which is they're going to finish their PhD and they are uh, looking for this, this next thing. So um, I'm going to bundle sort of a couple of these, but one is, is, does it hurt your future opportunities to do a postdoc in the same lab as your PhD? I've heard mixed thoughts. And then I'm going to sort of bundle that up with another question is, what types of interim jobs would you recommend if someone has graduated or is graduating from the PhD and hasn't secured a postdoc yet? So doing, you know, and this is this is what, what folks are weighing now, like, should I stay where I am and do a postdoc in my own lab or should I be looking for an interim job that isn't a postdoc necessarily? If, if I think if I'm paraphrasing these correctly, I'll, I'll leave it to, a, to one of you to choose yourself to start just unmute and forge on in. So I've been on a lot of searches uh, over my time here at Colby, and this is, I'm sure, different in different places and even different with different search committees, but um, it's all in how you craft your narrative, right? Like you are in charge of your narrative. And in your cover letter, if you talk about the work that you did as a PhD student, and then even if that work is in the same lab or at the same institution, how that work is growing, how you're expanding, what your goals are for that postdoc, that's gonna make the difference, right? You, go, you have to tell that story, whether you're staying at the same institution or whether you're um, moving to another place. Are you learning new tools? Are you asking new questions? Like what is it that makes it um, a, a step for you intellectually? Yeah, I don't know if I have much to add to that. I mean, I thought about it before I, when I decided to stay in Santa Barbara, I worried about that. And I did stay in Santa Barbara a long time working with a lot of the same people. I guess my, I think, as Denise said, a big question is, can you keep learning and sort of expanding what you um, sort of your skills and, and sort of growing as a scientist in, in that same position? Um, and then there's just a, a trade-off. There may be cases where you can be much more productive building off a system that you really know well versus moving to another system and, and, and having to, uh, you know, as an ecologist, having to learn a lot of new sort of the basics of how it works. You know, there's a real trade-off there. So I think it's not always wrong to keep working in the same system. Okay, thanks for that. Um, also, just a note to the attendees, some of the questions are, are quite specific. Um, and we're trying to put links and references where we can over in the quest, the Q&A part themselves. But one of the questions was, um, what are the best places to find job postings? How do I keep track of openings efficiently and Brian wait Brian Kim weighed in Twitter is a good place really quickly panelists where did you look you have any favorite resources for finding and tracking job opportunities chronicle of higher education which chronicle. is so old school and shows my age but um you know that's where we tend to post the stuff and that's where I found all the positions that I had applied to and even today when I'm like what else is out there that's where I go to look yeah, Chronicle of Higher Education, uh, Lisa said. Yeah, I agree. I'm old school too, though. Others? Oh, when I was looking, I there was this 
wonderful Google spreadsheet I wish I could find. It was for ecology evolution jobs. And unfortunately, it updated every year. And unfortunately, I lost the connection to like, you know, the most recent version of the spreadsheet. Otherwise, I would share it. But they listed a, lot, a whole bunch of um, uh, ecology evolution jobs, obviously, but they were also great at um, you could keep track of like how many people who came to the spreadsheet applied to the job. Um, and you could also keep track of like when updates had gone out. So did someone hear about references or interviews happening, things like that. Um, and so I really, really liked that. Just a word of caution, protect your mental health with that spreadsheet because it can be kind of nasty in terms of like, um, you know, you can see on there, oh, so, you know, people are saying they're getting interviews for this job and I didn't get a call and it can be a, a damaging space. So I think it's a useful tool, but also be sure to kind of protect yourself a little bit when using it. Yeah, I mean, for, for faculty jobs, I would say that that Google Doc is sort of an incredible resource to the extent that like often, I know when we hire like someone from the university is always keeping an eye on it and making sure that our little line like keeps updated correctly. So it's weird how it, it, it forms this semi-official route. For, for postdocs, yeah, you know, Twitter's taken over a lot. Postdocs is surprisingly poorly organized. Um, uh, you know, Ecolog can be useful for that kind of stuff, depending on the kind of work you do. I, I just, I wanted to actually respond to something Nicole said in her intro about postdocs. Um, my experience is often you don't have that many applicants for a postdoc. So I think there's a real um, communication problem with like getting people matched up to postdocs. But I just say that in the sense that like, I would push in the opposite direction. Like don't assume that they have an internal candidate and why bother apply. Like uh, both at Florida State and when I was at UCSB, we would, I I've been really lucky with the postdocs we ended up with, but often that was like the only person I would have considered out of like the pool. So I think it's, it is worth, it is worth applying to those open calls because sometimes they really are looking for someone and don't have anyone in mind. All right, just to be clear, I, what, I, what I should have said is that don't, don't rely just on that as your only avenue to find a postdoc. Sorry, I completely agree with Nicole's advice that if there's someone you wanna work with, like just reach out to them and tell them that you're interested. That is great advice. I just, I don't want people to be dissuaded from responding to advertisements because you would be surprised at how thin yeah. the pool sometimes is. I actually got my first postdoc through an advertisement, so I can't even like, you know, knock against that because that's how I did it, so yeah. Yeah, they are, they are still a perfect route. Sort of on a, a related topic, I, I want to also kind of plant the seed out there that um, people interested in particularly liberal arts schools that place an emphasis on, um, you know, quality research as, as part, of the, um, part of the job, um, postdocs and research intensive experiences post your PhD are just as important um, at small liberal arts schools as they are for the big schools. Um, I get a lot, I talk to a lot of graduate students who assume that they just need to come in and talk about how great their teaching is. And then they get here and we're like, what, about, tell me about your research. Um, so, you know, don't assume that you just need to focus on teaching for liberal arts schools. Thank you for that, Denise. It actually um, touches on some of the questions in the um, Q and A place, whatever we're calling it right now. So that that's really great to know. Um, so all right. So we've talked a little bit about get, getting your PhD and and finding the next opportunities. Let's talk about what a little bit a question here from Trisha Thibodeau about once you're there. So her question is: Thank you uh, for all your insights. How do you manage teaching while continuing to publish and write grants at an R1, R2? It always seems like teaching is expected of R1, R2 professors, but there's not enough time in the day to be an effective teacher and researcher. Thoughts? And so let's direct that to, to some of our R1, R2 folks here first, but um, any of you can, can take that on. You've all been students or postdocs at those institutions as well. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I guess I'll, I'll go first. I don't know that I have any secret answers here. I mean, this is part of why my answer to the previous question was, I don't know any 
faculty at my institution who work 40 hours a week because the teaching takes a lot of time and then you have research and you have people to mentor. And so it, it just takes a lot of time. And um, it would be a terrible job if I didn't really like most of that stuff, if I didn't really like teaching and research, like I enjoy my job, I love my job. And so it it's not a great job unless that's something that you're interested in doing and you get like, um, you get a, a personal reward out of. Like, I really like teaching. It takes a lot of time, but I really enjoy it. And I enjoy interacting with the students. And I enjoy it when they like, have a really positive response to a class that I teach. And so if, if you don't get that, then it's probably not a great career path for you, I think, because you're really gonna be ground down by the expectations otherwise. Yeah, um, I've, I'm just finishing up my first year of teaching and just actually finishing up my first solo class. And um, it, it takes time, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's not, it, it's not so much of your time that, I mean, I would say that I ever felt like um, things were, like I wasn't being able to like publish or write grants or get that stuff done during the semester. Uh, one way I dealt with it was uh, during the winter break, I tried to get um, a lot or a, a fair number of the uh, the lectures ready to go so that I had a backlog and so, like if I needed to like not work on a lecture that week I could I could like let it go and that helped me get through the semester and then also looking ahead next time I teach this class I've also got lectures that are now ready to go even if I need to make major changes to them but I have I have a, a baseline I would say also, hi, Trisha, you never showed me pictures of your pug. You promised you would do that. And so now I'm going to hold you to it. If I, sorry, just to get back on just one thing I, I think is worth saying for people who don't have a lot of teaching experience, but are thinking about faculty jobs is that it is a huge difference prepping a new class and teaching a class which you've taught before. And that's just worth being aware of both because it tells you something about the flow of the semester. Like when I taught a class for the first time or when I converted one of my classes for COVID, it suddenly like blew my semester out and everything was very, very tight. And if it's a class I've taught three times before, I have all the materials I've thought carefully about, you know, I change it every time, but it, it, it's really, really different teaching a class you've taught a couple times and a class you've taught, taught many times. And I say that also partly because as you are, if you are applying to faculty jobs or considering faculty jobs, it's a really important question to be asking, not just how many classes are you teaching, but not just how many classes you teach a semester, but how many new classes, how many total classes are you expected to develop it makes and sort of what the rotation of those classes is makes a really big difference in what the load feels like for you. Yeah, uh, one thing I just want to uh, build off of what what Andrew was saying with like the first time you teach, it's it's so there's a lot of effort that gets put into um, developing a class. Um, I was my class I was teaching was on phytoplankton ecology, which was my area of expertise, and there were still lectures that I had to sit down and teach myself. <laughs> stuff related to it and I was like oh I don't know any of this <laughs> I have to teach someone this um and so luckily none of my students are here so it's okay that they hear that uh but yeah you're you you will at sometimes have to to stop and really think about it but it all comes down to time management and if you manage your time appropriately and where you're at isn't expecting like Oh, like if I had two classes, two new classes I was teaching this semester, I would be telling a very different story than I am right now. But having one made, I felt like I could handle that as a new professor on top of everything else. I still got working on papers. I still got a proposal out, have another proposal almost ready to go. And that's all while teaching a brand new course. Yeah. Also, that's that's what that, that that was what my weekends went to. I try not to work on weekends, but it went it went towards classes. Right, right. Common story. Um, so on this note of of getting teaching experience, one of our attendees asks, what would be an alternate route to a postdoc? 
to gain teaching experience after my PhD to pursue a PUI job. And maybe to start us off, I'll, I'll put that to Denise, who probably has done some hiring, right, at Colby of, um, you know, what were, were people's teaching experiences and where did they get them when, when, they, um, when they came to apply, or at least the successful ones at Colby? Yeah, um, it's a great question. And I think um, there's no like one right answer uh, to that question. Um, there is, of course, the sort of visiting assistant professor route where you might um, take a year long position or if you're, you know, in some cases, a two or three year long position at a school um, like Colby, um, where you really um, are teaching instead of doing research. Um, and that is a tricky spot. I would think really carefully before doing that straight out of graduate school or even after one postdoc. Um, and I say that because of all of the um, insights you just heard about um, teaching new courses for the first time. Um, it takes up a lot of time. And you know that's a really critical moment for your writing, uh, for you know, staying connected to your research community. Um, and those VAP positions sometimes can lead people down a path of another VAP and another VAP and another VAP. So I think if you're looking at a position like that, you wanna make sure that you have strong mentorship at that institution um, and that the people you're working with really have an eye out for you and making sure that you're protecting some of your time um, to keep working on your research as well so that your application is strong for those tenure track positions. Um, we also um, have postdocs. Um, so we don't have graduate students, but we can have postdocs. So those of us who have active grants can hire postdocs who are based um, out of a place like Colby or, or Bates, uh, for example. Um, and those are awesome postdocs to have if you're interested in doing research at a small liberal arts school, because you'll get those little um, kind of one-off opportunities to engage in the classroom, but you're still really um, deeply engaged in research and you're demonstrating you can do that research with undergraduate students. Would any other panelists have any other insights on, on how to gain teaching experience? And this may, may go for, you know, students who aren't necessarily targeting a, a primarily undergrad institution, but just literally don't have any teaching experience. I know they're gonna need that for any of these academic positions. One I thing I, I will, oh, oh sorry, go, ahead. go ahead. No, are you, oh. go for Well, it. just one other thing I'll add, which I, I typed an answer to somebody this uh, uh, tip also. Um, we, in, in our review of applications, far more value evidence that um, people have taken it upon themselves to do things like trainings at their centers for teaching and learning um, versus like guest lectures in a class or TAing or something like that, because it really shows initiative around pedagogy and that's what we're interested in. So have you taken a lunch workshop around inclusive um, discussions or, you know, like other sort of bigger picture topics. And if you can show that you've sort of been engaged and interested in those kind of conversations, um, that's something that's really important to us. I was just gonna acknowledge that I think it is often a challenge in a postdoc position. There are some postdocs which have teaching built in. And if you're, you know, really interested in getting more teaching experience, you should maybe look at those. We do recruit some of those at Florida State uh, in my department where there's um, specifically a role as an instructor of record, which is funded by the university. But I had a, a postdoc who, you know, in the course of our, uh, just like working on her development plan, she wanted more teaching experience. And it was really hard, you know, she was a grant funded postdoc. It was really hard to come up with more than, you know, just guest lecturing and, she did do some of these, um, uh, the kinds of uh, training kind of experiences that, that Denise highlighted, but to actually get her to teach a class was not, we just weren't able to, to, to swing that despite my, my, my trying to make that happen. One thing you might think of as a graduate student is that I know um, sometimes there are opportunities for graduate students to teach and to teach like, for example, a class over the summer that they've TA'd a couple times during the regular, every university is different how these work. But you might think if the, there are sometimes opportunities for graduate students to teach as instructor of record, particularly 
over the summer. And you just might be aware that it, if you're on grant funds, it can be hard to make that work uh, later on as a postdoc. Um, I don't know how common this is, but uh, where I went to to graduate school, there was a nearby community college that was always looking for adjunct faculty. And I know some students, some graduate students were hired to teach uh, a class there. And so that was looking, looking outside your institution um, could be some possibilities for for teaching. Great. And on the teaching um, note, several folks have asked about teaching during the summertime. Lisa, do you have teaching requirements during the summer? Denise, and then Andrew, and then Nicole. Yeah, so um, even though we're on a, I think technically a 10 month contract, we spread our payout over a full year, um, recovered by benefits all year. So we have no requirements to teach in the summer. And we also have like a six or eight week winter session. So we finish in December and we don't start again till mid February, and we're not required to teach in either of those intercessions. You can if you want, and it is overload pay, so it's extra compensation, um, but no one's required to. There are some faculty members who go and do research in the summer, so we're not required to do any kind of research, but they use that time in the summer to go and do research activities, and then there are other people that just literally take the summer off or chase small children all summer. Um, so, so though it, there's no there's no requirement for that summer teaching. We um, speaking to adjuncts at our school, we have um, only about forty seven percent of our classes are taught by full time faculty. So we have a huge number of adjuncts teaching, and for many of our adjuncts, they stay on semester to semester, and so they really appreciate those summer classes because that is additional pay for them. I know I said an order, but I forgot it. So <laughs> Denise, maybe, and then Andrew, Nicole, very briefly, summer teaching responsibilities. No, we, we don't uh, offer summer classes at Colby. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, smaller liberal arts schools that have a lot of resources, you know, the nice thing is not only is our time uh, focused on research in the summer, but there's significant resources internally to fund students um, to support that work and to uh, fund, you know, travel or, you know, small purchases, equipment, you know, bottles and chemicals and that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, we can carry on our research um, with those resources internally, which is a super nice perk. Yeah, I mean, we don't, uh, it is, you can, you can teach in the summer if you want to, but but relatively few of the of the regular tenure track faculty are teaching in the summer at, at FSU. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm actually at a, a research institution that's just graduate students, so we don't have any classes that are really offered in in the summer. So that's that's research time for everyone. Right. So there's been a question that's gotten upvoted. It's been at the top of the list for a while and I've kind of been ignoring it. So I'm going to get to it now. Um, and it's it sort of once you're there again within, uh, within the jobs, how difficult is that switch from R1 to PUI or vice versa? For example, if you're at an R1 and you have a lighter teaching load, are you still competitive for, a PU, for PUI positions? Or if you publish less at a PUI, how competitive are you for an R1 job? So I believe the attendee is asking more about switch, you know, going from one faculty position to another, not necessarily from grad school to a, a faculty position, if I'm interpreting that correctly. I can offer my opinion on this. I, I think there's, you know, this is a really individual thing, right? And I think, um, so going from, uh, R1 to a PUI, um, you know, we tend to, we sometimes see, especially kind of after the COVID scare and like, you know, the changes to academia that have uh, cascaded from that, um, you know, we see folks from R1 schools applying uh, here. Um, and I think it depends on the culture of the institution. Um, and it depends on if they really like to bring in folks as assistant professors. Um, and if you're willing to do that, right? So if you've been teaching, uh, working at an R1 for three years 
and then, uh, you know, they want, or, you know, say you have tenure and they want you to go through a couple of years and go through tenure again at that institution, that's very common. So um, I think it's possible. And I think that um, it, it would just really very much depend on the person and the institution. And, you know, going the other way around from a PUI to an R1, I think if you're going to do that pre-tenure is the right time. So, in you know, you've sort of, um, been building up your CV, you've been really getting that research done. And that moment, right, like so that sort of year before going up for tenure, you're probably, um, you know, have some real, um, uh, you know, advantages over people who haven't had that experience. And if you're really connected into your research community, and if you um, are sort of, you know, keeping up with your research, right? I think, uh, I think it's possible, you know, I have been asked to apply for R1 positions and, you know, I, I think it is possible. It's probably not gonna happen for everybody, but if you um, stay engaged and you stay, um, you know, stay on top of your research, I think you can do it. Nice, okay. Um, all right, so we're we're we have we have a quite a bit of time left, but we're starting to wind down. And there's a few questions um, that are more round robin. I think. Um, let's see, a couple I can hold till the very end. But um, okay, so we have a question from anon from anonymous attendee, and they uh, are interested in knowing how important is experience with or the main maintenance of significant science outreach activities across these institutional types and positions. So I think they're getting at where you all sit, our esteemed panelists, do you do outreach? Is it important? Is it, is it you know, respected at your institutions? Is it critical for your you know, advancement at your institutions? Lisa, we haven't heard from, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but I am. I know. Because I'm um, the facilitator, it's my job, so. Yeah, you know, in terms of outreach, um, there's always a request for us to be willing to work within our community. Um, we're, you know, considered a resource to our community. We're the only community college in our little district. Um, it, it's not, it's not required. It is definitely something that you get get credit for service that that you're doing these things. Um, I guess if I interpret the question a little different. Um, you know, for outreach, when I think about that, I, I think about some of the equity focused work that we're doing on campus, which is incredibly important. I didn't say this at the beginning, but SMC is a Hispanic serving institution, which means we have 40% um, Latinx students in our, our college population and they don't do as well as our white students. And so we have a mandate from the state that we have to fix that. And so there's all sorts of ways of innovating the way we're teaching and how we're teaching and how we think about teaching. Um, some of this goes back to what Denise talked about with teaching experience, and sometimes it's better to actually have more training in pedagogical theory than it is to necessarily to have them more teaching experience, right? Sitting down and listening to somebody talk about how to design a course, you know, is far more useful than just being shoved in and said, good luck, you know? Um, so those types of activities at our at our campus um, definitely can help you with advancement, especially if you're looking to go into more of an administrator position, um, you know, having that sort of larger overview of what are some of the bigger problems that exist here and how are we going to tackle these seemingly enormous problems. Yeah, thank you for that, Lisa. I just want to interject for a second because our panelist Denise has to um, log off a couple minutes, pretty much now. Um, so be, I just don't want to miss the opportunity to thank her so much. Thank you, Denise, for for joining. I think the other panelists can stay for just a few more quick wrap up questions. Yeah. So thank you so much, Denise. Really appreciate it. And these are hard because you can't hear everybody clapping, but I know our attendees are all out there clapping in their home offices or wherever they're sitting. Um, okay, so thanks. So we have about, you know, 10 minutes left or so. And there's a couple fun questions that I just would love to hear from each of you on. So um, the first is from Ron Tremieno, um, and they ask, all of you have differing but related backgrounds. Is there one technical tool or skill set that you acquired that you can name 
that aided you in obtaining the position you are in. So a, a skill set or a, a technical tool that really did help you get to where you sit now that you can name. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. Okay, sorry, I was yelling at children and dogs. Is that um, your is that your skill set, Lisa? You can yell at children and dogs. <laughs> multitasking. Um, I was to say, having to learn how to talk myself up is the thing that I really struggled with, and I realized that it was probably why I was not successful in so many of my job applications. I was getting my interviews, and I was getting in there and just assuming that everyone who in the room had read all my materials. And they had it. And so, which it's a horrible thing maybe to say, but realizing that I had to remind people like, this is why you invited me here. These are the things I've done. These are, these are the skills that I have. And this is why you want me um, here. And so, you know, and, and those skills are things like being able to organize groups of students and being able to even just organize groups of faculty to do things and do projects. Um, that skill I think is, is really big. Um, I, oh, there's, I'm not, I'm not quite sure the right way to answer this question. I think there's a lot of different ways I could come at it. Um, but with like the, for one thing with the, the interview process itself, if once you get to that level, the way I always viewed it was I put on my conference persona. The, I am networking. I'm the most confident person in the room. Um, I have no doubts at all about my research <laughs> whatsoever. And I answer everyone's question with enthusiasm. And it's really hard for two days. But you, you, you put on that persona for, for two days and you don't stop smiling. And uh, that gives everyone just a good, warm, fuzzy feeling about you, at least. Um, but even, even before then, um, going back, you know, thinking about there's like a wide, I wouldn't say a wide range, but there's little things that like, I had mentioned this earlier about like, you know, my work with, with Sea Grant and NOAA and also like a NEARS site. This was all stuff that was more government related institutions and a lot more advisory focused stuff that I, I wasn't doing on purpose and it wasn't necessarily what I was completely interested in doing, but I I started like at one point like doing research that was more advisory focused and kept drifting over that way and kept doing those things because that's what I had done before so people kept you know funding me to do stuff like that and then I ended up at the lab where I am now where which actually has a requirement for advisory services to the state and so that probably played part of a role with helping me obtain the position that I'm in at this specific institution was because I um, just incidentally had all of this specific type of experience, one of many things at least. And so you, you never know these other opportunities that aren't necessarily research focused that you are building up makes you the perfect candidate for a job out there that you aren't even aware of yet. Right on. Um, okay, so the last question um, that we're going to be able to take on today, and I love this, um, and everybody probably has something different to answer to it, but uh, what is something you know now about academia that you wish you would have known before going down that route? And I'm gonna interpret this one also as an academic job, the jobs you have. So not advice to go to grad school, but the advice to, or, or your your advancement to a faculty position what's something you know now about academia that you wish you would have known before going down that route I, I don't I don't have 
I'm not sure I have a great answer for this because I felt like I kind of knew a fair amount of what I was getting into. I guess I'll answer almost something slightly different, which is that um, the experience of mentoring graduate students and figuring out how to sort of work to their individual skills and train them and run a lab is something that I really did not have a lot of preparation for coming into uh, my, my faculty job. And I don't actually know how you get that experience and prepare for it. I mean, you get it in many little ways, but there's almost like, it, it is amazing the degree to which at least at an R1, you are left to your own devices to do whatever you want. And, um, and then you have a lot of people that you're managing that uh, and you have no training whatsoever for any of that. So I guess that is all stuff that like, it's a little hard to fully appreciate that until you get into the position. And I, I actually think there is insights that you can gain as faculty or can gain about what it is like as faculty or help that you can get from like, almost from like the theory of like management, like you know, there are books that are intended for middle managers managing people, which like faculty should be reading because it's like, how do you deal with a team of people who have different strengths and weaknesses? And sometimes you have to have difficult conversations with them. And it's all stuff that like faculty are making up on the fly. And there's surprisingly no, uh, I mean, actually my department's been pretty good about trying to build up some support for this, but you're mostly on your own. And so, um, Anyway, that's that's not quite the answer to the question, but it's what comes to mind. Oh, I think it's I think it's a great answer. Nicole? I actually wanted to, to jump off of that because Andrew touched on something that triggered something in my mind that reminded me. So um, what he says about management is completely true. And I don't have as much experience with that because I'm still building up my lab. But uh, getting equipment into your lab and the big equipment is easy but those little supplies, you're so used to having pipette tips around and just jars and bottles at your convenience, but you have to buy all of it now. And you spend so much of the first year just being like, all right, I'm ready to do this experiment. And you have to make a list of, sort of 20 little things that you have to buy. And it's so hard to find everything. Even if you go to, to Fisher Scientific there's like a bunch of different varieties. And the hardest thing for me has been chemicals. I want hydrochloric acid. And there's like all the different varieties of hydrochloric acid. And it's like, which one do I need? And my poor postdoc advisor, who has just fielded so many phone calls and texts from me going, what specific version of this am I supposed to be ordering? Um, and yeah, so just have, have someone in your in your uh in your network that uh you can bother a lot i would just say is the only thing to do with all of these little questions um and one one little thing that's kind of related to this question but not that i wanted to add on to um when looking for a job in academia one thing that people really don't consider too much for an institution that they're looking at but is really good is how much support do they provide for graduate students because um, both andrew and denise talked about that stress of funding your lab and keeping these people fed and that's very very true um, but it helps a little bit if where you're at has a huge support net and can like, if if something was to happen and funding slipped through the cracks, they could come in and find a way to support that graduate student. And some places are better at that than others. And so that's just something to keep in mind. Thank you. I mean, it's funny and all Nicole, but you know, little questions like that take a lot of your time and then it becomes less funny. So appreciate that. Lisa, do you have anything you want to add to something you know about academia now that you wish you would have known before going down that route? And then, and then we'll close it out. I mean, it, it seems like a very naive thing to say, but I didn't realize how um, political institutions were. I just, and I think part of it's just being a grad student thinking like, well, maybe that's, you know, I had a really collegial department, although there were some quirks to it and and then as you move from place to place you know thinking well it, it, grass is going to be greener over here 
Um, and it's not a negative. It's just, again, it goes with those soft skills of interacting with people um, that, you know, we don't always, we don't at all focus on in science, those soft skills. And so, um, you know, realizing that that's something that I needed to work on, um, you know, Andrew talked about those difficult conversations you have to have sometimes, and that's part of this management, you know, that we never are given any training in, we just kind of pick it up. Um, and so, you know, I think having really good mentors and I call them academic friends, but people who are also in academia, who you can call, who will just listen to you and say like, yeah, that sucks. And just like reaffirm sometimes that what's happening to you, that you're not crazy, but then in fact, you're just going through something that's really difficult. They're not trying to fix it for you, but just, you know, they're there. Um, and so that's something that I've really, um, encourage people and it's funny because the people you go to grad school with are going to be your academic friends um, and follow you through your career and so you know those great relationships you have hang on to them and nurture them once a semester with an email to check in um, and keep those friendships up because then they also turn into collaborators and it's so much fun when that happens. Uh, yeah just just to reiterate on that very quickly um, from from my postdoc there was a uh, uh, four people I was really, really close with. Three of us started positions all around the same time and we're on a WhatsApp chat and we don't check in every, uh, every so once every semester, we're constantly chatting back and forth and we're all going through the same things and we're constantly reassuring each other. And one of us has already written a grant together too as well. So collaborators, <laughs> yay. Well, I just want to, to close this. I just want to thank you all so much um, for participating in this. I think I hope that it's been very useful for our mostly probably graduate student and postdoc attendees. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Brian, Kim, and Natasha Chrisman from the Graduate Student Committee of LTER who really, really put this together. And Marty Downs, uh, myself, who just helped with the technical side of things here. and. Uh, yeah, and um, Marty, do you have anything to add? We have we have quite a lot of resources that got typed into the Q and A. Uh, will we be? Can we download that maybe and make it available? Certainly, the recording of this entire webinar will be available to everybody. Yeah, we can make the uh, the links that were put into the Q and A available. The recording will be available on YouTube, and we'll post it on the website. Uh, on that same registration page within a day or two uh, and share it out to folks via Twitter and, uh, and other channels. So really, I just wanna add my thanks to Jens, how much we appreciate the time you guys have put into this and making yourselves available for it. And uh, you know, big applause from out there. You know, it's, uh, it's the way Zoom works, but Thanks very much. <laughs>